Hello, we are talking to Dr. Kim Johnson, the Anthony and Sabga Caribbean Awards for Excellence Laureate in Arts and Letters for 2011. Dr. Johnson is an academic, an historian, an anthropologist, and his major work has been uh, research on the steel band movement in Trinidad and Tobago. Hello, Dr. Johnson. Hi, Raymond. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about um, your research into the steel band? Well, um, I mean, it's, it's been ongoing for about 15 years, and it began when I was a journalist. And essentially what I'd say is that it, it began and was largely on the oral history of the steel band. That is, I've interviewed hundreds of these old men and women. Um, most recently, it has broadened its focus to include the pictorial um, history of the steel band, which involves collecting old photographs. So, I mean, in a sense, that is it. What that meant in a, a broader sort of analytic sense is that until I began doing that, people who wrote about the steel band wrote about an abstract entity called the steel band movement. And it was a sort of mythic narrative of, you know, uh, bad guys turned good. Uh, kind of fairy tale Cinderella story. And what I did was I took apart the story and looked at the individuals and the individual bands. The logic behind that was that um, if you were to be writing about, say, rock and roll, you couldn't not talk about the Beatles or talk about you know, individual bands and their character. If you were to write about um, reggae, you had to talk about Mali as opposed to Burning Spear, as opposed to Gregory Isaacs. You know, you had to go into the details mm -hmm. because that's how art, the arts and culture move by individuals. So I, I um, brought that focus to the steel band movement. Is that the major distinction between an oral history and a conventional history? Um, the conventional history tends to, to look at um, documentation, but I would say yes. That is at least one of the major distinctions because the oral history tends to focus on the activities and the memories of the individual. You know, where were you on this day? What, what did you see? What did you do? And it, it um, tends to bring the sort of everyday normal life aspect to history. So a lot of oral historians would write about everyday life during the Second World War. What was, what was happening during the Spanish Civil War. And they would talk to housewives just as much as they talk to men fighting on the front. And the idea is to give that I was there feel for it. What was the mood? What were people thinking? What were their fears? Now, this is not your only historical project. Um, you've written a history of Trinidad in the Age of Discovery, which also diverged from conventional historical accounts. That first book of mine, it was very, very episodic. I mean, it was like flashes. And it was completed when I began journalism. And in a sense, I wanted to convey what it would have been like if you had been there and reading the papers about these events. In other words, you're living there and something happened today and you read about it tomorrow in the papers. And then something happens next week. And very gradually, you build up a feel for living in the period by just being, you know, getting the daily news, getting the events. But that sounds like almost a novelistic fictional approach, or rather the approach that fiction writers use. I, I expect so, but um, in a sense, journalism from, from, certainly from the 70s, had become increasingly um, influenced by fiction. And indeed, I would think, I mean, our own V.S. Naipaul would have made, you know, opened a lot of doors in that regard with his travel writing, which influenced and was influenced by his own fiction. So yes, there, there was that. Um, and it would have been also influenced by what had become increasingly common, the, the movement away from the grand theory and the idea that reality is constructed by lots of little points of view rather than you know, one overwhelming point of view. You know, So-and-so is an African or an Indian or a middle class or a proletarian. That would have been going on in my head um, and being influenced by what I was reading at the time. Well, most of the people we've spoken to regarding your work 
have agreed that you have brought about a change in the way academic work is approached and the way research is conducted. Uh, could you tell us a little about that? You know, the one thing you learn as a journalist is that nobody bound to read what you write. You're not a, an academic in the sense that you have a captive audience of students and you can make them buy your book. Mm -hmm. You write things and you put it out there to the public. And if the public is not interested, they will turn the page. And you know, there's no hesitation to do that. So no matter what you're writing, how important you think it is, you have to be very concerned that the public is not going to um, follow it if it's not interesting, if you can't somehow pull them on. When I wrote non-journalistic pieces, it was always influenced by my acute awareness of the fact that you have to make people read this thing. A lot of your work, your impetus, your curiosity seems to have uh, started when you became a journalist. How did you become a journalist? That was just by chance. Uh, I mean, I had taken nearly two years off um, when I'd begun working on my first book, The Fragrance of Gold. And at the end of the two years, when I'd run out of money, uh, I needed a job. And that was around the time when um, TV6 opened up. And a lot of journalists moved into television. The TV stations had opened up, radio was opening up. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of vacancies in the print medium. Mm -hmm. And I applied and got a job. Now, journalism has traditionally been a kind of feeding ground for writers and so on. Uh, do you see that as being the case in Trinidad? I mean, do you see a lot of historians, academics, writers coming out of journalism? I know you've said that many academics seem to be detached from the real world that journalism traffics in every day. Not really. I mean, it. it a long time ago, journalism was a haven for, for aspiring writers. You know, when the society was much smaller and there wasn't much you could do. So there's journalism that uh, in The Guardian published by Sam Selvon. I have seen one or two journalistic pieces by Vidya Naipaul, a young Vidya Naipaul. And of course, his father, C. Prasad Naipaul. I mean, Derek Walcott wrote criticism for The Guardian. So in former times, it was a place where a writer could perhaps earn a few dollars and um, hone his craft. But I would say in the past, perhaps as many as 10 years, the, it has gone very, very far downhill. So that it is, it, is, it is almost painful for someone who has an idea of, you know, a, a grander idea of writing to be just focusing exclusively on, you know, what, who killed who last week and which supermarket got robbed and so on. But you are the laureate in arts and letters, so your remit, apart from just creating fact, factual narratives, your remit in this prize is also uh, creating an appreciation of what you've just spoken about, um, a grand idea. Um, so how do you see that proceeding, given the deficiency that you've just outlined? How do you see the consequences on the society at large of that deficiency? Well, I, I think the consequences are tremendous. Uh, I, I think, I mean, we complain about the, the problems. I mean, the most immediate one that everyone complains about, and understandably, um, if a bit exaggeratedly, is the problem of crime. You know, crime has turned us all into prisoners. We feel uncomfortable going out late at night and, and so on. That is a main problem. Um, and there are sort of subsidiary problems, you know, the, the kind of um, routine discourtesies, driving on the street, uh, you know, in public, and and in a sense, uh, perhaps someone like me tends to see a lot of this as being ultimately cultural. I mean, I deeply disagree with people who see it as an economic people aren't well paid and people don't have jobs. That's I think that's nonsense. You know, 40 years ago, people were far more badly paid. I mean, unemployment was considerably higher, but there was not this, this routine um, greed and viciousness. And I think uh, cultural problems require a cultural solution. Um, and when I say culture, I mean values, partly ethical values, but also aesthetic values. I, I see the the 
what is being done to the built environment of Trinidad as another form of vandalism. You, you know, when I was young, you, and you were fortunate enough to have a house that you could build, you had a veranda, which is sort of partly in the public and partly open, you know, you could invite people in the veranda who you don't necessarily want inside your house. You know, the, the, the man in the house would have drinks with his friends there or whatever. You could hail out the people in the street. Mm -hmm. Now houses are built, they enclosed, perhaps they're air-conditioned. And that is not just an architectural issue, that's a social, that has to do with relationships with the people, with other people, with the public. And all of these things are partly aesthetic, partly cultural. So how do you see, again, within your remit as the Arts and Letters Laureate, how do you see arts and letters being deployed to kind of address these problems? Well, one, one um, project which, which came out of the same discussion I was talking about with some architects, why don't we see if we could come up with an idea of short, you know, bite-sized pieces on the different arts. If you get a, a novelist or a writer to just talk about um, how Clear writing facilitates clear thinking. How if you're precise with your language, it enhances, it makes you more precise with your thought. Now you could interview someone, and say I might interview you for an hour on that, and cut that down to 15 minutes, make it a very tight 15 minutes. That may be, say, language and thought. Or it could be a painter discussing a painting or a theme or an architect. An architect could speak about, you know, a, a good articulate architect could speak about windows. Mm -hmm. um, so you could have these different views, which they bite-sized. You could run them every day, you know, one a day, one a week. You're talking a lot about film, but you too have embarked upon a career as a filmmaker. You've made two films so far. Yes, the Creole, yes. The Audacity of the Creole Imagination and yes. The Deaf Story. Yes. Could you tell us how you got into filmmaking? Well, it was, it was just, um, just partly coincidental and partly just following the logic of what I was doing. Last year, well, the year before last, I was invited to curate an exhibition at the National Museum on steel band history. When I sat down to actually plan it out, the first thing that struck me is that something that, that involves music is it's, it's dead if there's no movement, if there's no sound. Um, it becomes like a, I suppose, a museum piece in a glass case. Mm -hmm. So I thought that I would produce a short film to go along with the exhibition that would bring movement and sound to it. I named the, the exhibition and the film The Audacity of the Creole Imagination. The second film you made, The Deaf Story, and that is the title, Deaf. That? Yeah, it has, it, well, that's his subtitle, but I mean, these things change, yeah? Right. Um, the main title is Talk with the Hands. Right. And the theme of that is um, the world of the, the hearing deaf. impaired. Yes. Who, which many of us, myself included, like many other people, simply are not, a, we have no consciousness of. Oh, yes, that, that's true. Eh? Um, I mean, I got into that because writing about music and, and dealing with oral interviews, that is sort of a heightened experience. Um, focus on the hearing, on sound. And uh, the logic I followed is that if, for example, your spleen failed, all of a sudden you'd, you'd realize what it's good for. <laughs> and I thought, let me try to understand what it's like to not have this sense. So I began, I, I went up to the Cascade School and asked if I could learn sign language to interact with the students to see what their world was like. So out of, out of that encounter came that documentary. And, but it's a peculiar documentary. I suppose it would have been influenced by a, a, a film. You ever saw a film called Looking for Richard? It's a film by Al Pacino mm -hmm. about the making of um, King Richard. The, Richard the, III. Yes, the play. Mm -hmm. And um, what I wanted to do I didn't want yet again to tell the story of the deaf. I wanted them to tell their own story because the deaf who are by extension very often cannot speak, other people tell their story for them. And that has always been historically. And I wanted them to be able to tell their own. So I got them, I encouraged them to script a play, a skit. 
and perform it at UWE. And I filmed that process of them coming up with the ideas, you know, workshopping it, rehearsing it, and performing it. So in a sense, it's a film about a play. Okay. Um, um, so that, that was phase one. Um, phase two, you know, when I'd be up at the school with the cameras and so on. I mean, I, I'm a learner, literally. It, it, it has been a very steep um, learning curve for me and um, Katz Imai, who worked with me on this. The kids were very interested in what I was doing, and they'd want to borrow the camera and the camcorder and look at it. And I thought, just as a blind person has a very acute sense of hearing, I mean, we all know famous blind musicians. We all know Stevie Wonder and Ray Charles and Jose Feliciano. Is, the converse is true of the deaf. I mean, their visual sense is very, very acute. And I thought, they would be great with, with, with photography. And I came up with the idea of um, teaching them to make films. So I was able to get through um, the, the Ministry of Education some uh, sort of seed funds to get equipment through um, Steve Williams. And I bought some camcorders, you know, you buy it on eBay, you get cheap mm -hmm, mm -hmm. camcorders. And all, all of my friends and relatives would be bringing down, you know, this one two tripod and that one a camcorder and this one a laptop. And um, I made contact with a group called TGN Media, who, which teaches kids at risk in Rio Claro and Toko filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And teamed up with them, and we put together a program of filmmaking for deaf youth. And it was, it's five weeks since it's been going on, and it's, it's really been a remarkable success. I mean, these kids are doing things they never dreamt possible. Uh, and indeed, some of my Sabga Award will hopefully will contribute to that. Dr. Kim Johnson, the Anthony and Sabga Caribbean Awards Excellence Laureate 2011 in Arts and Letters. Thank you. Thanks, Raymond.